And I'm excited with our next interview. Um, we've got Senator Briggs Hobson, who is joining us from the Capitol. Senator, how are you? Virtually. Oh, there we go. Yes, virtually. There you are. We had just a little bit of a connection issue, but um, right. we're very, very glad you have joined us. Um, I understand your schedule is pretty compressed, so really just want to jump right in to um, one of the issues, the American Rescue Plan Act that was passed last year. Mississippi received a reported $1.8 billion from the federal government. And since then, uh, state lawmakers like yourself have been busy discussing how best to spend this money in the state. Um, now, I, I don't believe you just heard our previous interview, but we had a well-known individual throughout the state, Sid Salter, talking about the governor's state of the state address and how the takeaway was we are living in in a time of plenty, which is an interesting and somewhat different position to be in um, from the perspective of the state's leadership. But this past week, the Mississippi Senate um, just about unanimously approved the spending uh, $177.3 million of the America Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, money. Um, now, you are involved in the development of these plans. A common theme surrounding these discussions is the desire to make long-lasting investments. We keep hearing about generational investments. Can you just read us in a little bit uh, to, to what exactly does that mean and, and how are you planning to use this money um, to make long-term investments uh, that will last generations, uh, throughout generations of Mississippians? Sure, Mandy. Let me just, for background purposes, of course, the first tranche of the funds came through in May of 2021 after we had adjourned sine die last year. And the second tranche, the other $900 million, will come about May of 2022, roughly a year from the date of the first uh, disbursement. And what we were out of session, of course, and, and in the off offseason, uh, the lieutenant governor and I got together and we decided that we needed to put together a committee that would really study uh, and look at the needs of the agencies, look at the needs of our cities and counties and communities, look at the other private sector interests that might benefit, as you said, and others have said generational or, or transformational type changes in the state. And we, uh, we both agree, John Polk, my vice chair in appropriations, would be a perfect person to lead that committee. And he and the other senators, uh, Frazier, Butler, Michelle, Parks, Williams, and DeBar, uh, all worked really hard. And I sat in on most of those meetings as well as the lieutenant governor. And really what we've tried to do, and I say we, it's, it's Senator Polk, of course, Chair, but we've all been involved to a certain extent to make sure that we're looking at projects. And sometimes they may not even be seen. For instance, water and sewer is a great example. Uh, there's going to be a significant amount of money that will go into water and sewer projects in the state. And, you know, sometimes those are underground, you never see them, but they're the things that you won't have to worry about for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff we're talking about generational. Uh, I think you can also see uh, a good bit of money going into some things, at least in the Senate, we've, we've talked about mental health, some areas that we really need to shore up mental health and child protective services. Uh, we've had a federal lawsuit pending for years about some of the things that we need to do better in child protective services. And this gives us an opportunity to help uh, bring uh, some of the backlog that's that has existed in child protective services uh, up to speed and, and hopefully get us outside of this federal lawsuit and have things running like they should be. We've got other areas, uh, tourism. I think you'll see some funds going to tourism. Also, there'll be a significant amount of funding going to uh, a few other places. You know, there were four categories, broadband, really four general, I call it broadband, water and sewer, health related. And you're going to see a lot of money going to health specifically to try to get more practitioners, nurses, doctors, physicians, respiratory therapists, other uh, allied health professionals into the market because we have a shortage of people right now. Uh, and that's and that's a big issue for us in Mississippi. Well, certainly. And look, it's music to my ears to hear about uh, priority of investment in water and sewer systems. I would say my experience uh, serving at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, um, when these type of systems break down, it can really wreak havoc. And then my experience growing up in a, a teeny tiny little town like Decatur, Mississippi, um, where you, you don't necessarily have the tax base to support the high cost and the, the, the high degree of capital it takes to fix these sorts of issues. Um, I, I just believe it's a very smart move to invest in these types of issues. And I'm really I'll proud and happy to hear that work. 
Yeah, <laughs> it's that East Central <laughs> accent. <laughs> a little bit different than the Vicksburg type. Um, so, uh, so, and also on the the nursing the nursing shortage. So you'll be investing these dollars. Uh, so once you once you release these funds, um, do the cities and states immediately have access? Will there be a period of implementing regulations? Do people have to apply for it? Can you walk me through a little bit of the process um, once these funds are technically released? Sure. This is where it may get a little bit difficult for most listeners because sometimes it's hard, unless you're involved in, in the legislative process, it's hard to understand how this goes. Essentially, the Senate's putting forward 13 categories of, of uh, expenditures, uh, you know, the biggest of which is going to be the water and sewer. That's about $750 million that we're proposing. Others are specific things like the mental health and child protective services that I mentioned that are also big projects. Those will come through a normal appropriate, the latter two will come through a normal appropriations process. Those funds, we've got an, an appropriations bill specifically for them that says this will go to this agency. And we've identified um, uh, through the, our discussions with mental health and CPS what the needs are. Uh, the things like water and sewer will have a general bill, a process that they'll have to go through. So we're going to create a law that says this is how you access these funds. And for instance, I'm just going to, this is, hypothetically, because none of this has been decided. And I want the listeners to know, obviously, we're going to pass things in the Senate. It has to go down to the House. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, they'll pass it pretty quickly, too, and we, go, we can get it out to the people. But water and sewer, by way of example, would be one where we're going to set up a matching process. And likely, it'll be DEQ or some other Department of Health, one of the two, that will actually be the administering agency. They may contract with another group that actually looks at applications. Uh, there'll be a process in, in the water and sewer where the cities, counties, and the rurals will have to put up some matching funds for the uses that they want and make sure it qualifies, of course, within the guidelines. But mm -hmm. uh, so it depends on the area. I, I guess that's the, I gave you a long answer for really what could have been a tree. It depends on what bucket of funds you're going to as to how complicated, hopefully none of it's complicated, but you know, whether you've got to follow certain steps first. Well, there's always more to the process um, that I think most folks uh, would would want there to be. So it's it's good to let folks know um, what are the next steps once you all agree to the actual plan. Now, I imagine you've been talking closely and working with your House colleagues on this. And so once it's sent over, do you expect that it, it will get through the House rather expeditiously? Well, I want to back up to what I said earlier. Senator Polk was the chair of the uh, ad hoc committee that the lieutenant governor and I created. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm letting him take the lead on those discussions. And I think he's had some discussions with Jason White, and um, uh, who's the pro tem over in the House, and, and maybe one or two others about some of the things that we're looking at in the Senate. But I, I've not been involved. I've got so many other things going with the regular appropriations process and other general bills that I'm thankful to have a guy like Senator John Polk, who does a great job to be able to take the lead on, on the some of the details that you're discussing and asking about. Yeah, no, certainly. Well, and just to switch gears really quick, uh, we, we just saw that the Senate passed the medical marijuana bill. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about that? And then what's it's got to go over to the House. What's the expected timing of getting something like that through and, and finally across the finish line? Yeah, well, this was the conference report that was passed. What happened is we passed a bill over oh, the first week of session or, or thereabouts and took it down to the, went to the House. They made a few changes. Uh, and the, um, the, the conference was invited. In other words, the two chambers decided they couldn't quite agree on everything, but the conference between three House and three Senate conferees took place, I think, yesterday. And today, Senator Bryan presented the, uh, the, the full body of the Senate, the changes that were made. And, and frankly, just to be quick, because I could talk about this for a while, the, the big changes were one, they removed the language on the commercial, using commercial uh, property in cities and counties. Two was they uh, changed the dosage amount down from 3.5 grams to three grams. And then the third thing was removing the Department of Agriculture. I've got real concerns about how that's going to work. I mean, it seems like the Department of Agriculture would have been the perfect place for them to look at the cultivation and the growing part. Uh, apparently, I'm told that the Department of Health is going to have to contract with somebody else to do that. It, it's um, that that part has me a little uh, not concerned. Yeah, I guess it is concerned a little bit. Just just confused as to why uh, that would not be the appropriate entity to utilize for the growing part of the 
Uh, but that change was made, and, and uh, you know, sometimes when you get these conference reports, they're not perfect, but they're, they're the, you got to take it all or, or, or take none of it, and that's kind of what we were left with today. Well, it certainly is a give and take. Um, well, uh, it, I think folks have long awaited the progression of that issue, so um, it's good to see that moving through. Uh, Senator Hobson, thank you so much for joining us today and walking us through the state of the ARPA funds and reading us into the recent movement on medical marijuana. I hope you are off to a great day. And for our listeners out there, stay tuned. We have more after the break. <laughs> 